Hello, everyone. William Shakespeare said, what is the city but the people? In 2023, we should ask, what are the people doing to their cities, to their world, to their planet? Almost 70% by 2050 will be living in urban areas. How can we ensure the cities of the future are environmentally sustainable and socially resilient? I'm going to discuss this with my esteemed guests and speakers today, and I'll be also lis listening to you, to your questions and to your viewpoints on this. Allow me to welcome, uh, first uh, joining us today, Alice uh, Cassiraghi. She's a global shaper from the Milan Hub from Italy. Uh, also with us will be Adil al Jubair. He's the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, member of the Council of Ministers and Climate Envoy for Saudi Arabia. Um, also Desmond Lee, he's the Minister for National Development and Minister in Charge of Social Services Integration of Singapore. Uh, we also have with us Jocelyn Forms. Formsma. She's the CEO and the National, uh, at the National Association of Friendship Centers in Canada. She's a fellow young global leader. I'll try not to be biased today. <laughs> and uh, Diane Binder, she is CEO and founder of Regenopolis uh, in France, also a fellow young global leader. Uh, you're welcome. I'll start with uh, Minister Adel Joubert. Um, the Bloomberg said it's a science fiction. The Guardian said it's a mad project and won't happen. The Wall Street Journal said NEOM is weird project and is getting weirder. First of all, let's get the facts right. Is NEOM and the city the line inside NEOM, is it real or fantasy? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. It's great to be here. And secondly, with regards to the quotes, I think uh, I hate to disappoint all the naysayers. Uh, Neom is a fact. The line is a fact. It is a, a transformational uh, project. It is something that the world has not seen. It will radicalize and revolutionize uh, the way people look at cities and look at urban planning. It is thinking outside the box that has not been uh, attempted before, and it is uh, underway as mm -hmm. we speak. Um it's supposed to be as big as New York City. About 9 million people will be living there. Um, is, is this economically viable? Of course it is, otherwise we wouldn't be undertaking it. And we are not known to be naive people, we are known to be very thoughtful people and people who think long term. This is a very long term project. It is a, a, a very ambitious project. And it is a project that is transformational, not only for Saudi Arabia, but I believe for urban living in general. This is an attempt to create a, a city uh, that is environmentally friendly, that is uh, sustainable, uh, mm -hmm. which has a very high level quality of life, that has uh, virtually no traffic. You can go to different places very efficiently without uh, using cars. There are no cars. Not um, one single car? It's, uh, it's going to be different types of transportation that are, uh, like I said, environmentally friendly. There will be, uh, it's based on renewable energy. It's uh, very efficient. Quality of life will be very high. The idea is that people should spend their time uh, in productive ways. They should spend their time uh, working. They should spend their time exercising. They should spend their time socializing. They should not spend their time in traffic. They should not spend their time going from point A to point B inefficiently. Um, and that it should be, uh, it will be environmentally sustainable. And it is a, uh, a very ambitious uh, project. And it is, like I said, a project that will transform how people see urban life. It's a dream. When will it happen? Mm -hmm. It's a reality as we speak. The project is underway. The construction has begun. Uh, it will be, God willing, completed on schedule and within time. And I believe people always say that the proof is always in the pudding. Um, and with all due respect to the naysayers, they can say anything they want to say. We are determined to proceed with it, and we are proceeding with it. And in the end, uh, nothing succeeds like success. Minister Desmond, uh, Minister Desmond, um, Singapore was a dream, like me, um, 50 years ago. Uh, even leaders, Singaporean leaders, they used to say it used to be dirty, polluted, high, high rate of um, unemployment. Now it's called city in a garden. 
How did you get this to this stage? So thank you for having us. We're very honoured to be here. And uh, we like to share our experiences, but also learn, learn from you and learn from around the world the best ideas. Because Singapore, uh, we, we've achieved what we've been able to achieve because we've learned from other countries and tried and tested them out in our city. But just to give you context, uh, Singapore is, has about two-thirds the population of Switzerland, uh, but uh, about 2% of your land area. Uh, we're the size of Finland in terms of population, but 0.2% of land area. So we're a city-state, and I wanted to be very sure that you understood that uh, because of context. Uh, we're a one city, and that city is the country. Uh, many of you are used to the idea of a country with many cities uh, and lots of hinterland, but we're a city-state. Uh, we, we have one of the highest densities of population in the world, and because our land is finite, uh, and because of our historical circumstances that led us to independence, we were pushed uh, into independence, uh, out of historical circumstance. We've had to uh, be very pragmatic to survive. And uh, part of it's got to do with very careful planning. Our land is very precious, and the only resource we have in Singapore are our people. We've got no natural resources, just people, and 728 square kilometres, uh, no natural resources. So that meant that all the needs of our people had to be within the city. For many of you, the necessities that you need for city life, but which you don't like to live near to, your airports, your seaports, your power generation, your waste management, can be placed far outside the city. Uh, but for a city-state, we, we don't have that luxury. Everything has to be within the city itself. So very careful planning for all the needs that we have, very coordinated work between government, the private sector, and the community. And most importantly, uh, we have a 10-year cycle. Every 10 years, we have what we call a long-term plan review. We consult our citizens, we consult the private sector, we consult social enterprises and non-government organisations in order to plan for our city 50 years down the road. So every 10 years, we have a 50-year plan in order to give us a sense of what challenges there are ahead of us and in order for us to do our master planning exercise. So 50-year horizon for your concept, but then we do master planning where we go down like Lego bricks. This area is housing, this area is mixed use, this area is business, this area is port. And be very, very judicious in our land use because we just do not have any slack. Uh, and then, of course, when we talk about sustainability, uh, we need to have political support. We need to have the support of the private sector. And when we say we'll be net zero by 2050, we will get there. We will get there. We have government coordination and inter-ministerial committee on climate change and we have very clear targets for the power sector, the chemical sector, housing, industry, and so on, to drive towards mm -hmm. our targets. Um, I'd like you all to prepare t your questions towards the end. The last 20 minutes sh should be your voice. Uh, if you'd like to tweet and use social media, it's hashtag WEF23. And I like the mix today because we have a mix of uh, the food systems, uh, Diane, regenerative cities, and uh, Jocelyn is going to talk about the people. Diane, the question is yours now. Um, tell us more about the concept of regenerative cities, and is it usually plans like Minister Adel Joubert uh, puts with his government and uh, also whoever is uh, um, planning uh, for Saudi Arabia, and also the Minister Desmond Lee for Singapore, does it look like this initially? And do they make it happen, really, those governments? Well, thank you very much, Rima, for, for your question. And I'm, I'm very honored and happy to be part of this panel. So um, for me, cities is a, is, a, is a fascinating topic because it's somehow the hope or, or the deadlock of our civilizations. Uh, there are about 200,000 people moving every day or growing cities every day. And cities are responsible for 70% of greenhouse gas emissions for 40% of GDP, for 30% of biodiversity loss. But they're also uh, a laboratory of innovation, a hub of talents, and there's really the possibility within the cities to reinvent, to reinvent a new model of prosperity within planet boundaries. And this is for me very much what regenerative cities are about. And the way I would define regenerative cities is basically on two pillars. One is how can urban development 
contribute positively to regenerate the natural ecosystems that cities depend upon for the survival of the population. We're talking about the air we breathe, uh, the water we drink, the food we eat. So how can we think of nature positive solutions uh, that allow a city to grow, a population to have access to services, but also protect and regenerate the nature around. So that's one pillar. And the second one is about the social contract. It's about uh, the inclusive, inclusiveness. Uh, at the end of the day, a city is the way we choose to live together. So how can we make it work for each and every one of us to have uh, access to essential services and access to opportunities? Um, and there are different um, ways to get to uh, what I call regenerative city. Um, and this is what uh, the vision of Regenopolis when it was uh, founded. Uh, it's really about one, uh, supporting local solutions. Because at the end of the day, if you want a city to be truly sustainable, solutions must come locally. Must, and, and, and those solutions need to be supported, consolidated, and, and that's uh, I, I've, I've been working in, in Africa most of my professional life, but and, and, and usually uh, projects that are uh, led by SMEs or entrepreneurs need access to expertise, access to markets, access to financing, access to partnerships. So this is uh, what we, we aim to provide. And uh, a second point is to bring everyone on board to build the city, to think about a specific topic. It could be housing, it could be uh, mobility, it could be uh, water. You bring together at the city level local governments, uh, the, pri the private sector, uh, NGOs, civil society, really trying to figure out how together we can uh, come to a solution and offer a collaborative solution. And the third one is about the role of forests. And I hope we get to uh, maybe talk more about it. We will talk and, about it. And Singapore is a wonderful example. And but Saudi Arabia, I mean, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman promised uh, how many trees? Seven million. The Saudi Green Initiative envisions 10 billion trees, and the Middle East Green Initiative envisions 40 billion trees across the Middle East region. Mm. So there will be many forests. It's a, a very important trees, uh, point for urban development because it stabilizes water resources, it has an impact on, on climate, on biodiversity, on well-being. Yes. So this is important. Uh, I'll, I'll move on to, um, uh, to, to Alice. Uh, tell us more about the sustainable food uh, and the circular uh, sustainable food systems and the circular uh, economies. We're talking about the cities, and then we will talk about the people. What about the food? Yes. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Um, so yes, um, sustainable food systems. Um, it's not just the solutions that have to come from um, the, local, um, the, the local reality of the city, but it's also the resources. And so um, circular economy means that um, a city or a service or um, um, the, the, a supply chain, a given supply chain needs to be designed in a way that it's regenerative, that it doesn't harm, harm the environment, um, and that potentially no resource is designed to become waste. So, uh, especially in the food systems, uh, a city uses very little land, but for, the, for the, the space where the citizens live, but it uses a lot of land in terms of generating the resources needed to feed these people in the city, to dress them, to build their houses. And so we need to know, um, we need to make sure that the, the, the food that goes to the city doesn't go all around the world in um, crazy supply chains that go from one side to the other just for food to be packaged and then go back to the source. Uh, we need to make sure the food is uh, seasonable, is sustainable, um, that uh, is produced as locally as possible, and that, uh, that also farming is integrated with um, the city, with, uh, with how the citizens live the city, because we have seen with uh, the recent shocks in uh, supply chains, the pandemic, with uh, mm, the war now, that food can be a liability. So, and, and, and you were saying uh, Singapore has its own land, and, uh, uh, and it's a city-state. Uh, we need to make sure that these cities can feed themselves and do it sustainably without uh, harming the Resilient towards shocks. Uh, Jocelyn, I want to talk about the people. Those old cities, beautiful old cities, I love them. And the new ones who are like full of dreams, 
they have people in them. Who are they? And if you can talk to us more about the indigenous people, uh, you coming from, uh, from that uh, population also. Thank you. Mwache Misoe, Shwebanish, Nishnakasun, Muskri, Nitostin, Maika, Netotem. And I'm going to go on a limb, maybe saying that that might be the first time the language of the Muskri has ever been heard at the World Economic yeah, Forum. What's this language? <laughs> it's the, the language of my peoples, uh, the Muskri, or we call it uh, Ilulu, ilu, is, can the, you, is can, our term. Can you translate what you said? Because some of this panel is being broadcast on Bas some yes. TV channels. So basically, I just said um, my name in my traditional language. Um, and I said I am from the Moose Creek First Nation uh, and uh, that I am from the, um, the, the Wolf Clan. Um, and so it's, uh, it's good to be here. And um, yeah, who lives in cities? It's, it's people, you know. I think we sometimes get caught up in these words like economies and cities and it's like, it's, it's us, it's our everyday experience, you know? Um, and it's people who come from a lot of different backgrounds. I think we forget sometimes that cities are not homogenous um, uh, populations. They are made up of communities, they are made up of neighborhoods, and that um, not all of those communities are treated the same within the, the cities. Um, so I work with indigenous peoples who uh, live in cities and towns across Canada. Um, the Friendship Centers provide a wide range of programs and services for uh, by and for indigenous peoples who, who live in uh, cities, towns. Um, now we, when we say urban, <laughs> We have the opposite. Uh, we have tons and tons of land, um, and our cities are quite small when we compare them to the rest of the world in, in Canada. Um, but globally, Indigenous peoples make up about 5% of the population, about 470 million uh, people in about 90 countries. And there's no single definition of, of what is an Indigenous person, but generally, we look at it as self-identity and community acceptance, um, a historic continuity with pre-colonial or pre-settler societies, uh, and distinct social, political, economic systems, and a strong link to the territories, lands, waters, or even ice in, in the case of the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. Um, and we also have rights um, that exist in addition to our human rights, rights we may have as women and children. There, we have indigenous rights, and they've been articulated in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And I would say, you know, there, is, um, there can be sometimes a view that Indigenous peoples are of the past, that we are relics or that we, you know, some people are surprised, are surprised we still exist today. Um, and not only do we have very vibrant and thriving communities today, we are also very, very active um, in helping to shape the future. And um, across the globe, uh, Indigenous peoples are also becoming increasingly urbanized. Um, whereas I think uh, this stat, and I'm, I might be wrong on this, so I have to be fact-checked, but I believe that it's getting close to just over 50% of Indigenous peoples now are living in uh, urban environments. And at least with the case of Canada, that number is closer to 74, 79% yeah. um, and can be as high as 85% in some regions. Where Joyce has ended, I want to also um, start with you, Minister Jubeir. Uh, Saudi Arabia had a population 100 years ago of about uh, 2 million people. Now it's more than 30 million people. A third of them are foreigners, I think. What's the policy for Saudi Arabia? Who do you want to live in those old and new cities? Um, uh, and how are you building socially resilient societies or maybe rebuilding them, especially in old cities? Riyadh is buzzing with life. I was there, the traffic, the people, the mood. But this has also a downside. So how are you getting ready for all of this? Well, uh, in terms of who lives in cities, everybody. Um, it doesn't really matter if you're Saudi or not Saudi, if you're young or old, everybody lives in cities or, or everybody can live in cities. The key is to uh, make sure that cities are user friendly, um, that they are attractive physically. So you do it through planting, through greening, uh, user friendly in the sense of uh, mass transportation, ease of transportation, reducing traffic jams, uh, creating parks, creating uh, pathways, exercise areas. In Saudi Arabia, we're building in Riyadh the largest park in the world, the King Salman Park. We have a, an exercise belt in, in Riyadh that is more than 100 kilometers long that goes around the city where people can bike, hike, walk, uh, ride horses, exercise. The objective is to uh, not only make the city efficient and productive, but also make it uh, friendly, user-friendly, 
and make it physically attractive so that people go out and take advantage of what the city has to offer in addition to work and museums and restaurants, but also parks, uh, exercise areas. Um, this is what we're trying to do. And we have a, a program that was launched that is uh, overseen by His Royal Highness the Crown Prince uh, called the Saudi Downtown Project that looks at uh, revitalizing cities uh, in uh, more than 20 cities in Saudi Arabia where we look at the city the composition of it, the makeup of it, and see how can it um, be revitalized, how can it be energized, how can it be made user-friendly, how can it be made environmentally friendly, uh, so that uh, people not only live better, but they also enjoy living in cities. And we believe that at the end of the day, a, uh, a healthy, a content individual is a more productive individual, and that contributes to the well-being. But of what's the, the policy for, like Riyadh, or you'd like to encourage people to stay in rural areas, stay in other cities in Saudi Arabia, especially the, for Saudis? The objective is for people to live wherever they want to live, and the objective is to make life for individuals uh, as as productive and as pleasant and as efficient as possible, whether they live in a small town or whether they live in a, a large metropolis area like Riyadh or like Jeddah, um, the objective is the quality of life. Yes. Uh, Minister Desmond, uh, Mr. Jubair said people can live wherever they want to live. But this can be a challenge for governments, right? Because the environmental challenge, the everything, the, the cities are... Riyadh, I think, has how many people now? Uh, uh, nine, eight million people? Uh, uh, almost eight million people. Eight million the, people. The greater metropolitan area, So yes. what challenges the governments face, uh, Minister Desmond, when everyone wants to be in the city? I think the challenge is to strike a balance between development to meet human needs and wants and conservation. Uh, protecting the forests, protecting the coastlines, protecting nature areas which humans desperately need. I think during COVID, when there was lockdown, a lot of us found a lot of respite, a lot of restfulness going out into the forest, going out into the parks, going for a run uh, in the green spaces and the green lungs of a city. And so for us, I've said before, this is a matter of necessity, but I think having compact cities uh, which are well integrated, well resourced with the services that people need for all, all ages and all stages of life and all kinds of needs uh, will be the way to go. Uh, and so for us, a very small city, very dense, about 8,000 people per square kilometre with everything that's normally outside the city inside. I said we have, we have good planning, but that then allows us to strike a balance between nature and the city. Because for us, uh, we are quite envious of what you have here in Switzerland. You have beautiful countryside, you have lots of vast amounts of forests around beautiful cities and towns. But for us, it's quite the reverse. Nature is within the city. And so for us, our green gems are in the heart of the city. We have core biodiverse areas with some primary rainforest. These are primordial rainforests. And they are surrounded by us, by our housing, by our roads. And while people may want to have aspirations where they live, we need to strike a balance and conserve these core nature areas and ensure that flora can disperse and fauna can connect even within a city as dense and intense as ours. So that is the, the, the balance. And as to where people can live, uh, there's freedom, but we are also one of the most ethnically and religiously diverse societies in the world. We have many ethnicities in Singapore, uh, not, not just people coming from overseas, but people who have been living in Singapore for many decades. Uh, we are one of the most religiously diverse countries in the world. Uh, and therefore, uh, making sure that, that diversity translates into neighbourhoods does require some intent, and some people may say controversial policy approaches. Yes. Um, Diana, what, how do we measure the success of cities? What's a successful city? Well, I think if we, if we were to measure success only by uh, an increase in the wealth and revenues, uh, that would be um, a big mistake for humanity. So I think one of the ways also to, to measure success is actually, which is the case in, in, in Riyadh and Singapore, is like the well-being of people. Like how well do people live? Um, and there are different ways to measure it. There are 
you know, um, the social uh, progress index, for example, measures uh, basic needs first, so water, shelter, um, medical care, uh, and then the access, uh, so access to uh, mobility, access to education, uh, access to, uh, to jobs, um, and then opportunities. And it's also very important to think about uh, what, what do we want to get? But uh, who, me who measures this? Because any government you ask, they're going to tell you people live happily. Not <laughs> governments are not going to admit. Who, what is the measurement? Who, who's, who defines all of this? So there are some, some metrics that are being used. Uh, so I was just me mentioning the, the social progress index. Uh, there are some um, uh, governments also that are uh, gathered in the, within the Wellbeing Economic Alliance that are using uh, objective and self-reported measures of happiness and well-being, uh, and some governments include them. Uh, for example, New Zealand is, 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 is one of them. So there are different ways to do it, and, and I think this is by this measure of well-being that we can see if, whether it's, uh, yes. a city is successful or not. Jocelyn, uh, ministers uh, Aljbeir and uh, Desmond are saying people can live wherever they want. Uh, Diane is speaking about re services. Uh, what pushes indigenous people to the urban areas? What are the push factors uh, in your opinion and experience? Certainly, and, and I, you know, of course I'm speaking from my experience, um, uh, but I think there's a lot of similarities of, from other communities, and of course I come from Canada and experience in North America, which may not be the same uh, around the world, I, I recognize that, but at least for us, you know, there are those pull factors that bring you to a city um, that is a genuine choice for people to go. Sometimes they call it, you know, love or money. If uh, <laughs> you go and uh, find a job or you find a partner and you want to, you know, have a family that's close to services. But I think in our experience, what we've seen is um, a lot of people uh, aren't making a conscious choice to move to the city. They feel like they have no other choice or they're being forced in, in some way. And some of the, the reasons for that um, are uh, because of lack of investment or access to things like healthcare, um, how, proper schools, housing um, within the rural uh, areas, especially remote or on, on, on reserve. Um, in the north, especially the far north, because of uh, violence, escaping violence, um, but also because of forced displacement, sometimes due to military activity or conflict, um, and climate change increasingly is pushing people into urban urban spaces. Um, climate change is changing the landscape, people are getting flooded out, and where they've traditionally lived for thousands of years, suddenly um, the landscape is changing so much that they can't participate. Um, and uh, uh, just a stat that I learned the other day that um, I can't remember the time frame of it, but um, the about 40 million um, indigenous peoples have been displaced from their traditional territories over over that period of time. So there's certainly some deliberate um, uh, actions that have, that have been taken that um, uh, are, are pushing uh, indigenous peoples from their yes. traditional territories into the into the cities. Um. It's actually, I haven't been in, in, in Davos, uh, WEF Davos for many years, eight years now, and it used to be snow covering all the road from Zurich, most of the road from Zurich to Davos, and now there's barely any s snow. There's a lot of climate change that's posing some challenges. We'll just talk about this in a bit, but Alice, when we're talking about some new cities, and probably it's easier than working on old cities, uh, how... How do, do governments and designers t take into consideration the uh, good food systems when they're working on those cities and how challenging it is to uh, implement this in all cities? Yes, um, I'm a designer by trade, so I think a, a well-designed city, a well-planned city is essential, and you can plan on cities that are already existent, old cities that have to continuously serve the needs of the citizens, or you can plan a new city. But I think in 2022, if you want to be careful at planning how the people will live in a city, you have to consider the um, social and planetary boundaries. So you need to consider the social foundation, that is the needs of the people that leave the city, uh, their needs in terms of uh, food, health, and uh, uh, jobs, and all the basic needs that have to be met uh, for human rights. 
but also the planetary boundaries. So how is the city going to affect the strain on resources? And cities uh, historically have always been uh, built around uh, water streams because of course you need water, that's the first essential thing. And water is, uh, we've seen through the drought, is becoming scar a scarce resource. So we need to implement new solutions to um, respect the nature and to make sure that we can always have the fresh water for our crops, for our citizens, and, um, and, and uh, take care of uh, really not just the city, but the land around the city. And um, this is a, a, an example from history, but when Venice was a, a very important city back in the days, its success was not determined by the fact that the city was at the center of the Mediterranean, and it had the port, and, and that's it. But it was also really the ties with the surrounding uh, nature and the fact that they could provide enough for the population to thrive and to not care about funding food, but doing their business in the city. Uh, Minister Desmond, uh, when the government is working on an environmentally uh, sustainable and socially resilient city, uh, who are your partners? Uh, you say in 2050 we have a challenging and ambitious environmental plan for Singapore. Who do you work with and how do you solve the hurdles and challenges? Is there any resistance from the people against certain plans? Yes, yeah, so when we do our long-term planning, we consult the population. So for example, last year we had our, had our latest long-term plan review, planned for 50 years ahead, and we have exhibitions all over the island, and 15,000 people contributed the ideas specifically. We work with citizens, we work with community groups, we work with NGOs, we work with corporates uh, in order to identify what are the trends globally that a city-state has to be prepared for, what are the opportunities that we can seize for our people, and then with that consensus amongst the population, then start working on the minutiae of detail. And that is where sometimes unhappiness can arise because, well, you're going to build an industrial park here or you're going to build housing across the road where previously you know, it was empty, empty field. And, and that's where the NIMBY issues can arise sometimes. But you must build from top down and from ground up so that for a dense, diverse city-state like ours, we get the broad consensus of our people. Minister Jubair, um, first of all, I want to explain Saudi Arabia is mostly full of deserts, uh, half of the size of Western Europe. The size of Western Europe. The size of Western Europe. Um, and there are, the world knows cities like Mecca, of course, um, Medina, Riyadh, Jeddah, Al Khubar, but then we have the new cities, Niyom, Oksakon, Trojena, mm -hmm. and the Gidea. I love the Gidea. Um, what's the difference between old and new cities, and how challenging it is for you to work on old cities and change? neighborhoods and make them environmentally friendly and convince people? It's uh, the old cities grew naturally, um, as was mentioned earlier. The, a lot of them had to do with water wells and uh, along wadis where, where farming was possible and life was possible and sustainable. And as they grew, of course, the, that issue became less important. Uh, with newer cities, you start with a blank, on a blank slate and you can design it in a way where you think uh, this would be optimum in terms of efficiencies, this would be optimum in terms of quality of life, this would be optimum in terms of sustainability. So you can, you can do that. In some ways it's easier to start new, and in other ways it's not. Because with old cities they have their character, they have their history, they have, um, they have the, uh, the sustainability built into them. And what you do is you essentially uh, upgrade them, you provide services. People move into cities or they, because they want uh, jobs, they want uh, culture, they want education, they want health care, um, they want uh, opportunity, they want uh, entertainment. I mean, all of these issues uh, uh, put together make up the city. In terms of smaller towns or villages, it's also the same principles, but to a smaller extent. The, um, so what you try to do is you look at the city and say, how can I make it more efficient? How can I reduce traffic? How can I make the city more pleasant? How can I make it more attractive? How do I provide avenues for people to be able to exercise? Or and do you think the Saudis are more, the, the population, more convinced and aware of the climate change and the importance of being environmentally friendly? Absolutely. I mean, we are people of the desert. 
Um, we are part of our environment. Uh, we, we are susceptible to sandstorms. We are susceptible to heat. We're susceptible to cold, like every human being on the planet. And we want to be able to deal with those challenges, and we want to be able to accommodate uh, in, a, in a way that uh, improves the quality of life for everybody in Saudi Arabia. So definitely this is a priority uh, for us in, 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 uh, in Saudi Arabia. And the, uh, the key is really to uh, improve the, the quality of life as much as possible by making cities more efficient and more attractive. Yes. Uh, Jocelyn, uh, Minister Adel is saying, and it's basic, it's easier to build cities from scratch. But when we talk about uh, old cities ha that are being renewed uh, uh, by governments, um, to what extent do they take the opinion of the, the people living there, the indigenous people? Tell us more from your own experience. Well, I mean, in Canada, a lot of their cities are actually built on uh, traditional gathering areas that same where along waterways or very, um, they were summer gathering places. And, and, and so the cities are just kind of literally built right on top of um, where the indigenous peoples would, would be making their livelihood. Um, and they approve of this? Uh, <laughs> No, because if you look up the entire system of the reserves and, and there's been forced uh, removal of indigenous peoples from their lands in Canada, uh, in the Inuit in the north, they were forced to relocate. Um, so I would say definitely not that they were always removed with the permission. And I think today we still see these cities that there's still a lot of segregation um, and maybe to a certain extent within the United States as well. Um, and that this idea that if things are better in the city, you have more access, um, I don't think is necessarily true because with the segregation, we see that availability of services like healthcare and education and the job market, um, the availability does not necessarily mean accessibility, especially for indigenous communities. And, um, and that could be true also for black communities, uh, communities of color, um, uh, the 2S LGBTQ plus uh, for children, Children, for people with disabilities, or other equity-seeking seeking groups, we can do better. Um, and, and just you know, to the, to the point on on um, I know we're going to talk about it in a moment, but this idea of resilience and being socially resilient, I think we were reminded that resilience is in the face of um, it's the ability to adapt to difficulty. It's in the face of stress and adversity that we become resilient. And actually, we need to flip that idea on the head that we need to be creating an urban environments that are wholly inclusive of uh, the people that are there, and that we make sure that. Um, if there is availability, that there is the also ability for these communities who have been marginalized to also access um, those available services. Uh, uh, Diane, um, it comes to me sometimes the idea of probably having environmentally resilient and sustainable cities and socially resilient is something for the rich developing countries, developed, com developed countries, not for the third world countries. Um, is it costly to, to be environmentally friendly and to care about the climate change? Is it a, is it a luxury for third world countries? Well, I think the, the cost of today is nothing compared to the cost of tomorrow uh, if we do nothing about it. So it's, <laughs> so it's probably um, more of um, somehow of a luxury for, I would say, Western countries. Uh, because we always, you, we have a tendency to think that um, uh, floods or drought are happened in developing countries, when now it's happening more and more uh, everywhere. So, but I've been working in Africa for over 15 years, and it's it's uh, it's not a matter of choice; it's a matter of survival. And what is very interesting in the African context, like, you know talking about cities, so the, the population of the continent will double in the next uh, 20 years or so, and 80% of the growth will happen in cities. And most of the cities that will exist by then do not exist today. So there is really a chance uh, to do things right from the very beginning at a lower cost than if we were to fix the damages uh, later. Uh, Alice, um, before I pass on the mic to the audience, if you prepare your questions, um, so there was the war uh, in Ukraine, the food supplies were threatened, many countries needed wheat, there was no wheat coming, uh, countries in the Middle East uh, had this problem. There's also the drought, like we've seen 
uh, the dry weather summertime in Europe. We, we, we barely saw any green this year. All of this, how does it affect the food systems and how can you make a city resilient? Because you, you depend on uh, imports. Yes. Well, I guess I think we got a bit drunk, a bit drunk with the globalization. Um, and uh, we thought that we could uh, have one country or two countries produce the whole wheat in the world. And, um, and uh, we displaced uh, sometimes the least productive crops, but the most essential ones. And then we're feeling the shocks right now. And the shocks come for uh, a, a variety of different reasons, as you said. I think one way to be more sustainable in terms of food systems is um, diversifying because we tend to always find one solution and then go for it 100% because if the whole world altogether goes for, for, for that solution, it's going to be uh, cheaper, more economically viable, but then it, must not, it might not be the smarter solution. So if we diversify and contextualize our needs, then the food system can be more resilient. And one way to do that is, for example, uh, tapping into the indigenous knowledge um, that knows the land and knows the land around the cities. Um, and um, we, send, we send people back to the rural areas? <laughs> no, we, we need, don't. We, do we, we need more farmers? Maybe we integrate the rural area in the city, no? And, uh, we can... and who wants to be a farmer these days? <laughs> Everyone wants to be Elon Musk or... There are people that uh, experiencing the life of Elon Musk want to, be, to go back to become farmers, but I mean, I think people are free to, to do what they want, to live in the city or to live in the countryside, but the point is that it's not just the individual choice of a person, but it's the society as one, it's the city that also needs to be able to provide for the citizens. So um, I'd like to open the floor to questions, your questions. Um, Someone is going to be ma passing the mics. Please say your name and where you're from. And uh, there will be a unified question to my esteemed panelists and speakers today. What's your dream city in 2050? How does it, how is going to be, to look like? Um, uh, I'd like to see the light is not helping me. Let's start with the front row, the gentleman over here. I'll try to include everyone. I don't know how much time we have. Thank you. Um, so I'm Anas, I'm born and raised in Saudi, a little bit uh, near to Neom. Um, uh, but I, I just have a question about um, the, the line and the expandability of the city. Um, now, the line is limited to 170 kilometer uh, in length. Um, so what would be the plan if, if the city want to grow uh, even further? Um, in respect that the, the, the other cities near uh, to near uh, to to the line is not quite close, so how how would it work exactly? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a it's a um, it's it's a huge project that will take many many years to complete, and as the project moves forward and as the line is completed. Um, and people move in, then you have uh, expansion is built into it. It's organic, it's natural, it's not designed to be imposed on the environment, but be a part of it. And so this is how, how it will go. And hopefully, God willing, uh, it will reach its potential very quickly and, then we can, and, it, and it can expand very quickly once it reaches that point. Um, but it's not designed to be a, uh, a, a, a one size that is not expandable. Um, that this is the, the vision for it, and, and this is the, the progress that's being made on it as we speak. Um, there's a gentleman over here, the second, third row. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Collins from Nigeria. Um, my question is to Minister Lee. Um, in Singapore, right, um, I've always wanted to go to Singapore, and I've never <laughs> been. I'm trying to go this year. Um, how do people, like, I've always wanted to move there, like, work there, have an experience in Singapore. But if you go online and try to, you know, apply for, like, a visa or apply for a stay, it's so difficult. And um, you have to go through an agent that is a Singaporean or something. But, you know, I'm, I, I want a, a, a country where, you know, I live in Canada. I'm a resident of Canada, so, and I'm from Nigeria. I want to go there and get an experience, the Asian market, right? So um, can you make it very, is there a way, 
your country can make it very easy for people trying to immigrate to Singapore to get an experience there because it's a beautiful country. Thank you. Uh, city, yes. Thank you. Yes, we have employment uh, regulations and processes for people. And if you've got uh, an employer in Singapore, uh, then they can apply for the relevant work passes. Uh, the criteria are all set out online. We welcome talent to come to Singapore to supplement the Singapore core uh, because we are really a cosmopolitan city. Uh, I, I see a lot of hands raised by uh, males. I want to see some females asking questions. There's a tendency. Thank you for the gender balance. I am Christina Gaigos. I am from Boulder, Colorado, and I would like to actually give you the opportunity to make a call to action to the people in the room. This is a very diverse and very powerful panel. What do you have for us? What should we do? We are here. This is a very interesting place to be. This is a selection process for everyone who is in the room. Do you have a call to action for us? Who do you want to? Yeah, Alice wants All to of answer. them, all of them, each of them. Alice and Joyce. Let's start with Alice. I think the, I think the call to action for everybody in the room is um, to use your voice, not as a consumer, but to use your voice as a worker, as a citizen, to really make better choices in terms of the food we eat, in terms of uh, the sustainability of uh, everything we have. I, I think we put too much um, focus on us as consumers, but we have another leather, a leverage. As a designer, I can design better things. I can choose with my job and, and with my citizenship. Yes, Jocelyn? Yeah, I, I think um, the, the ability, what, what had Alice has said, but giving you a few questions that you can ask to the people in power in your communities. Who owns and controls the means of production and, and the communities? Who are the owners and, and controllers? And if they're not representative of the community that you want to live in, then you know that should be a signal to make some changes. Who has a voice in the decision making? Um, and who, at the end of the day, is getting paid? Right. So you need to be thinking about those questions for yourself. And if it is not at the very uh, at this time right now is not reflective of the kind of community that you want to be living in, then that gives you an ability to go to the, your representatives and to um, you know people or to organize within citizens groups um, for yourselves to make sure you're making those demands and you're making those um, desires known and trying to shift the tide so that to ensure that those communities are made up and reflective of the types of community that you want to be living in. Diane? Yeah, I think as a, as a citizen, you have, you have rights, but also you have a responsibility. So you can both um, share the vision you have for your own city, but also walk the talk. So you can choose to uh, uh, walk to work, uh, to uh, exercise, to switch off AC, to, uh, uh, to, to go to parks. I mean, I think it's very important to um, share and, and experience and, and the, the vision you have for, for um, the city. I'd like to pass the mic to another lady. She is uh, over there, yes. Let's hear more female voices before we pass it on. Yes, thank you very much. So my name is Manuela Forster. I'm from Bavaria. So I was a bit concerned when you say, so everybody wants to live in the urban room, in the urban areas, because I think especially the rich people are looking for the nice homes in the countryside. So there must be some attractiveness. So I would like to have them included, so the rural areas and all the, for the indigenous people, I think it's a very good idea to really think about how we can make them part with all their wisdom knowledge and, and their yes. cultures, how they, we can make them part of the urban concept. And if you have answers, it would be great to hear about. It's, um, it's actually the studies that say 70% will be living in urban uh, areas by 2050. But Minister Adel, governments allow people to live where they want, but they also need to prepare their rural areas. Do you think enough is being done for the people to stay in rural areas? Yeah, well, definitely. We in Saudi Arabia, for instance, when we embarked on our development plans many decades mm -hmm. ago, wanted to ensure that the same services that are available in the cities are available in villages and rural areas, for example, healthcare, education, uh, roads, uh, water, electricity, so that uh, the people who live in a village or in a small town 
uh, have the same quality of life as those that live in the city. Now, it will be at a smaller scale, just given the fact that a city of six million people is going to have a different dynamic than a, a town of 20,000 people. But the people who live in a small town will have hospitals, they will have schools, they have electricity, they have running water, they have yes. a police department, a fire department. The idea is to make sure that the quality of life is the same and leave the choice to where people want to live to the people. Jocelyn? Yeah, I, I, I think I, that's what we should all be striving for within these territories. Um, right now, just to give you a sense, um, my, my home community, I live in a city, I live in Ottawa. Um, my home community, you cannot access it by road. You can only get there by plane or by train. And in my territory, which is the size of France, that has a population that is minuscule, um, I grew up in the rural area, a town of 1,000, a town of 3,000, and then a town of 45,000. I would be back home if I could. Uh, my home community right now has no housing available. Um, if I could live there, I would move back. And it goes to that point again of making sure that those things are accessible. If somebody in my territory wants to go uh, for a medical appointment that is beyond what can be provided at a nurse's station, they have to fly thousands of kilometers to go to a city to access basic medical appointments. And never mind if you have complications with a pregnancy or if you have long-term cancer. And I don't think people really understand the disparity um, that exists in places like Canada. Um, I think they assume uh, it is one way, but understanding that diversity that exists there. Yes. Uh, we started late, like 10 minutes late, so I think I have more time. I thought, I don't know if uh, someone from the organizers can help me how much time we have. I would assume 10 minutes. Yes. Uh, there's a gentleman here over there he wants to ask, so let's pass the mic. And then another lady here. Um, try to be brief, because I'd like to take all your questions. Of course. Jocelyn, hi. My name is Eleanor. I'm a CEO of North Private Wealth uh, from Canada. Um, I've been working for the past few months with chiefs from different communities and treaties across Canada. And a lot of the issues that you've mentioned, several of you mentioned, we've, we have them in Canada, especially in indigenous community. Um, it seems like the, the theme that we've been seeing for the past two years due to COVID is uh, supply chain interruption. However, people seem to overlook the fact that corporate greed, uh, where we've seen $2.1 trillion in profits in the last quarter alone. Um, it's not, um, you know, people ask for better wages <clears throat> or, um, or, um, or inflation, the cost of living that's been going up due to price gouging is the problem. Uh, we've seen in different, uh, and it seems to be the common theme between different communities, uh, healthier food comes at an extremely high price compared to let's say, less healthy food. Um, I think we should be paying attention to more reg regulating yes. uh, the, the, the price increases of certain necessities um, rather than just, you know, blaming the, the theme of uh, supply chain. Justin, you want to comment or uh, quickly, Just please? very, very quickly. I'll go back to the question about the who owns and controls. I think to Alice's point, what she talks about in terms of food sovereignty and food security is the same. Um, we shouldn't have to continue to import foods to our communities um, when our, we've had systemic disruptions of our traditional harvesting practices. So I think um, we really need to go back to ensuring that um, the ownership and control is within the communities and that they're able to actually assert their own food sovereignty to feed themselves within their community without having to rely on anybody else. Hi, I'm Dina Benningoff, uh, CEO of uh, Charisma Nova, Creative Agency for Strategic Transformation from Switzerland. And my question is, uh, in regards to reaching sustainable life, not only in cities but worldwide, it needs uh, adopting of sustainable mindset, not only in politics and economics, but I think all down the way to the individual level and cultivating um, culture of sustainability. What is your thought about this, how states uh, and cities should approach this in order to cultivate a culture of sustainability worldwide? Is the question to someone specific? Uh, whoever wants to answer. I, I can. Yeah, I think. Diane? Yeah, so I, I think this is a very, very important question, actually. And um, uh, if you think of uh, regeneration of the planet and regeneration of our societies, it actually starts with regenerating our own mindsets and ourselves. And we really need to shift from uh, a, a production and consumption model 
to a more regenerative model, to a positive loop where people implanted at first. So it really starts with uh, education, educating people to uh, change the way they consume, uh, the way companies produce, um, so that um, globally we can reach not only sustainability, which is really uh, trying to keep the system as it is, but really towards regeneration, which is leaving the place in a better place than we actually find it. Uh, I'll hear from the gentleman over here. Let me see more hands up. We still have some time. Thank you very much. I'm German Prince. I'm the CEO of the German Federation of Architects, representing all 140,000 architects in Germany. And first of all, congratulations to your visionary approach in Saudi Arabia as well as in Singapore. However, in Germany, this would never be possible because of our system of um, participation, of course. You have to ask everybody of democratic values and all of that. And we're constantly struggling between how much can we impose on the people knowing what be the right thing and how much do we have to follow the people because they want something else. And I wonder how do you balance this in your cultures, which is of course different. We're all looking to Copenhagen as our model city, which has everything, bikes and path lanes and walkways and everything. But that is of course is a very communal approach. So how much governmental guidance do we need? How much actually freedom do we have to take from people in forcing them to have a better yes. living standard and how much not? Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Desmond, if you can answer first. Yeah, so, so, you know, if you leave cities alone with their invisible and very powerful social economic forces that will just stratify your city. The wealthy will live in a particular area, the less well off somewhere else. Uh, they also stratify uh, based on ethnicity. You'll have certain racial enclaves in certain parts of your city. And so in Singapore, as I said, we are very diverse. Uh, we've had to make difficult choices, but we're still ultimately subject to the people's support. For example, uh, you know that in Singapore, 80% of our households live in homes built by the government. And 90% own their homes. Our home ownership rate is 90%. But nevertheless, in every apartment block, we have rules on what proportion of each ethnicity can live there. Now, when I say that in a United Nations session, people can, can, can get quite shocked. But ultimately, people have to accept these kinds of rules because in our view, if we leave it be, firstly, people will stratify based on their ethnic or religious way of life. I think that's just part and parcel of these invisible forces. These policies are intrusive, they are not popular, but where people find that there's friction, when I try to sell because I'm an ethnic minority and I, I run up against difficulty because of the rules, government will step in to smoothen the rough edges. Because you have a greater social good, but you must make sure that the people are not hurt as a result of achieving these broader social objectives. Same for, for wealth stratification in where you live. Some parts of Singapore are looking like New York, like London, very wealthy people in very exclusive gated communities, high-rise luxury condominiums. So government must intervene. We have used a lot of resources to take land in those very wealthy areas, and I build public housing there, including putting homes for the poorest people in our city yes. and making sure that there are services for them. Okay. So this requires active intervention, but the people have to be persuaded and they have to support. Uh, Minister Jobeir. Uh... Yeah, I think um, you have to, when it comes to designing cities and when it comes to uh, zoning and things like this, listen to the people. And in Saudi Arabia, we do. I think the fact that we may do it differently than you might do it in Germany does not mean that it doesn't exist. We have our mechanism of communicating with our people. We have access to our leaders, access to governors. There's a give and take. Uh, ideas uh, are, are developed, ideas emerged, and based on those ideas, that's when you start implementing. You can't come into a city and decide from the top of your head, I'm going to do one, two, three, four, five. You have to know what it is that people are looking for. And then you try to take what they want, what people are looking for, and you try to uh, implement it in the most efficient manner. So it, it is a, a, a dialogue, and it, it is an ongoing dialogue. Uh, between uh, within within the city and within the urban community yes. and with the government. Alice, briefly, please. Yeah, yeah, very briefly. Um, I, I don't think the the suggestion here is to stop listening to the people. I think uh, 
there is a way to manage the participatory process and there's a design process to do that and it should be integrated in the government. Um, so you can manage the feedback, but uh, it's essential to listen to the needs of the citizens. I still have one minute or I can have one more question. One minute. One minute. Let's wrap with one round of questions that's unified. Uh, I'll start with Alice. What's your dream future city or the ideal future city? Okay, Briefly. first of all, yeah, it's a city that is still there and it's not flooded, so we must act fast. <laughs> and, uh, and it's a city that's open and listen to the citizens. Mr. Adel. It's a, a city that's attractive, a city that's uh, livable, a city that has no traffic, a city that's environmentally friendly. Minister Desmond. Every city a net zero city, compact, vertical, livable, resilient. Jocelyn. After talking all about cities, I actually want to go home. <laughs> but the same, you know, green space, water, uh, inclusive, where I feel like I am represented and I see, um, you know, my culture and my community represented as well. Diane. <laughs> it's hard to come last. Agree with all the above. I would say I'm um, green and happy. Thank you all. I wanted to take all your questions, but uh, time is always a channel. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for my esteemed panelists and speakers, and thank you for WEF for this interesting conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.